In this problem video, we're not going to need a calculator. We're not even going to have to have a pen and paper necessarily. But what I want you to do is look at these four structures. And I want you to think through all of the possibilities they're going to have to interact with the same molecule. So this molecule interacting with the exact same structure, this one interacting with the exact same structure, and so on. I want you to think through, do you have dipoles? Do you have ions? Do you have polarizable atoms? Think through all of those. Think about the total amount of intermolecular forces you expect for each of those cases, and predict whether you think it's going to be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Pause the video and give it a try. OK, now on this, the answer is not the key part. The thing you need to focus on is your logic to see if it's matching up with my approach because I'm going to show you how I approach these and you'll want to start building some of that logic into your own approach so that you're able to solve these sort of problems. Now in this case here we have carbon bonded to chlorine. We know that that's going to be uh, a polar bond. We know chlorine is going to be more electronegative than the carbon and so I'm expecting that each of these are going to have dipoles that are sticking outward. But when we remember that it's a three-dimensional structure, we're also going to say that while the individual bonds are polar, the molecule itself is nonpolar. So I have no ions. I have no dipole for the entire molecule. Right there, that means that the only thing I have left are going to be London forces. Now I always have London forces, but these are going to be even bigger than usual. And that's going to be because this molecule is very polarizable. If I bring something else nearby, it's going to help polarize it a little bit. Now suppose I brought another one of these molecules. The chlorine here and the neighboring chlorine are going to start synchronizing very easily. The electrons can shift around a decent amount here. Um, the, chlorine, the chlorine is going to be fairly squishy as halogens go, uh, and it's also going to be very electronegative, trying to tug at the electrons of the neighbor. As a result, we're expecting that the London forces are going to be reasonably large. Now, if we're thinking through states of matter, we're going to have gas, we're going to have liquid, we're going to have solid. Now, I'm not expecting that it's going to be a gas because I've got big enough London forces on this that I'm expecting a decent amount of interactions. There's enough partial charges and polarizability on this thing that it's probably going to be pretty sticky to its neighbor. I don't know if it's going to be enough to be a liquid or solid. From my own experience and intuition, I'm going to say that it's going to be a liquid because it's still pretty small. We still don't have a ton of the accumulated forces, and the amount of negative charge on the outside is going to be totally uniform, as is the total amount of positive charge in the center. So there's really not going to be an easy spot to stick. You can bring another charge nearby and squish it around a little, but it's not going to easily stick. For that reason, I'm predicting liquid, and I also know what this molecule is, and yes, the answer for this one will be liquid. But liquid or solid would be reasonable answers. Now, somewhere around room temperature, it actually will start evaporating pretty quickly, and so gas is a possibility for this one. Its freezing point isn't super low either, as these things go, so your intuition would be okay, but probably you'd want to be picking solid or liquid as your best guess on this one. Now, if you didn't have a shot at that logic or you, you didn't approach it the right way, pause and give it another try for these remaining three structures, and I'll keep going in a moment. Okay, so I have no ions. I have no dipoles. And notice that these are all carbon-hydrogen bonds. Those are all very nonpolar. So the only thing I could possibly have here is going to be London forces. So then we think to ourselves, what matters most in London forces? Well, we have big squishy atoms. Those are going to be things that are polarizable, and they're going to be things that uh, allow it to have bigger London forces. We also know things that have lots of atoms are going to have lots of London forces, and things that are heavy are going to have lots of London forces. We also know things that are in a straight line are going to be very polar. Now, notice that these carbons 
alternate along in a straight line. So this is going to be something that has a pretty good chance at being polarizable and something that's going to have good London forces. I've also got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So six carbons. I've got, let's see, so two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Oh, and let's just go ahead and fix that so that we actually have the correct number of hydrogens on the end. That was naughty of me. Now we're back up to a reasonable molecule. We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 hydrogens, 13, 14 hydrogens. We have a total of 20 atoms on this. That's a large number of atoms. As a result, I've got 20 hooks and loops for a Velcro set. This thing's going to be reasonably sticky to its neighbor. I'm also going to point out, well, okay, but as these things go, this isn't a giant number of atoms. We're not up into like the 100 or 200 number of atoms. So I'm not quite sure that I want to call this one a solid. I don't think I want to call it a gas either because it has so many London forces. I'm going to predict that this will be a liquid. Now, if you wanted to, you can notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Six carbons. If we were to name that, it would be hex. There's no double bonds on that, so it would be hexane. And if you go to a lab bottle shelf, you'll find hexane sitting there in the liquid phase on your shelf. That said, it's also very volatile. It evaporates very easily. And so hexane just evaporates right off of that and becomes a gas very easily at room temperature. So you can see that we're probably going to be OK predicting it's going to be somewhere in the liquid range, probably not big enough to be solid yet. You know, but not tiny enough to be a gas either. That's the general idea that you want to be using on these. Now, am I being very hand wavy about this? Absolutely. But we're going to get a bit more practice and intuition and experience looking at these structures throughout these videos for the chapter, and you'll start to build that intuition of your own so you can start making these predictions. Now, let's look at this next one. The next one is going to be vitamin A. Now, we have no ions. We do have, notice he shaded it blue to make it jump out, we have something polar. So we can have dipole dipole. Let's get rid of that. We can have dipole dipole. More to the point, notice that we have oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is one of our magic three atoms, the ones that are allowed to do hydrogen bonding. We check to make sure the hydrogen is directly attached to it, and it is. That means that if we have another one of these molecules nearby, we're going to have the oxygen and the hydrogen, and this whole thing is going to just be shrubbery hanging off over this direction. Instead of rewriting it, I'm just going to scribble it like that. We have a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen. We have a very polar and positively charged hydrogen. It's going to be able to create an attraction to that pair which we draw as a dotted line, like that. That's going to be something where I'm expecting hydrogen bonding. So we have dipole-dipole, and we have hydrogen bonding. And of course, it doesn't want to write. All right, ing, good enough, bonding. That's totally what that says there, hydrogen bonding. Now, I'll also point out, we always have are London forces. Now, when we count up the number of atoms here, we very rapidly say, wow, there sure are a lot of atoms, and we stop counting. We look at this and see the alternating double bonds, and that's something that really allows electrons to move back and forth very freely. And when electrons can move back and forth very freely, it allows it to be very polarizable, and that means that you can have really, really big London forces. Lots of atoms, lots of London forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding. This thing is almost certainly going to be a solid. And I think that's a pretty reasonable guess for this one. Vitamin A is probably going to be a solid. How about vitamin C? We take a look at this one. I've got one, two, three, four different spots that can do hydrogen bonding. And you'll really start to notice if you have an oxygen, hydrogen hanging off of something like this it's almost certainly going to be something that can do hydrogen bonding. I'll also point out that when we talk about our, uh, our acids, 
or oxo acids. Remember when we studied those, we said, hey, look, if there is also a double bonded, here, I'll just pretend for a second. If there's a double bonded oxygen sticking off that carbon, we can have this be an acid and this hydrogen will pop off. Why was that working? Well, because that would leave behind electrons here. You have resonance here that made it very stable without this. We don't have that here. We don't have it stabilized enough without the hydrogen. That's why in an alcohol, which is the term for an OH group without a double bonded oxygen sitting over here, we don't end up getting enough stability for this bond to break. That's why when you see an OH, that doesn't mean it's an acid. It has to have that structure that I just described. However, it does mean it's going to be an alcohol, and they're going to be very polar. We can have hydrogen bonding whenever we have this alcohol structure on it. I'll point out, we also still have other dipole-dipole capable sites on here. There's another spot with dipole-dipole, and another one, and another one. We have lots of atoms. We have lots of London forces. So I have no ions. I have dipole-dipole. I'm going to have hydrogen bonding, and I'm going to have my dipole-dipole interactions. I'm predicting that vitamin C is also going to be a solid at room temperature. That's the logic set that I use when I go through these sort of problems. Now, we don't know exactly what the melting point of vitamin A or vitamin C is. We could be just barely below freezing at room temperature. We could be just a little bit above it at room temperature. We'd have to look it up to get a little bit more specific about it. But just to get a quick feel for what's going on here, we can predict that those are certainly not going to be gases. And we can also start to come up with some other things, like whether we think it'll be soluble in water. And we'll see that in some of our later videos.